everybody. Welcome back to uh, Addiction and the Three Principles. Uh, my name is Greg Suki here with Harry Dravitsky and a bunch of the regulars here. And uh, today we're going to have a discussion about uh, the truth about addiction and where it really comes from. Uh, but before we get into that, I kind of wanted to check in with Harry. Uh, he's been writing a book and working on a video series for, uh, for this addiction series. Kind of, kind of shorter clips. I kind of want to check in with Harry and see how that's going. I, yeah, I just want to give a progress report first on on these two projects. Uh, the first project uh, that comes from our last thirty nine shows is 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 a shortened version of Golden Moments, trying to develop sort of a course for people to grow in and also to provide a resource for those who are teaching the, the, the three principles in addiction, our addiction and, and the three principles. And uh, so uh, what, I, what, what I've been doing over the summer is having people like Tom and different people who, who look through a show and then they take what they see as golden moments. And then I take golden moments from from their golden moments, breaking it down, and and so and what what the what has evolved is is that there are about 15, 20 minutes each each session, and 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 I'm trying to develop it in in a way that that will be helpful. So the first two are being done right now, but with uh, Julian Friedman of of Stars of Wellbeing from England. And he's, he's creating, helping create the first two shows. And the first, the first one is uh, a, a small introduction by myself and then a talk by Keith uh, from his book about Sid because of the importance of bringing Sid along in this message. I don't want to leave that out. And, second, and then it's followed by Joe Bailey doing an, uh, talking about his experience with Sid and then the evolution of addiction uh, recovery. So that's the first video show. The second video show is uh, three stories, one being by Greg Suki, who's of course right next to me. Uh, I've always been elevated by, by Greg's story. To be honest, it's the reason why we started this series was because of his experience. And, and I just, it touched my heart. And, and then Christian McNeil is the second story, and Tanya Evans is the third, is the third story. So those are the first two, uh, first two, and they'll be out hopefully within a couple of weeks. And, and then we're going to uh, continue to le release a series of two or so each time over a period of time because it's a lot of work and, and, and so on. And so... And also, I would like to emphasize for other people who are watching the show, A, I would love to have still a little bit of help with some of the shows, and B, uh, please give your feedback off the first two so that we can imp keep improving them. And you, ha you have to understand, this show is a reflection of our participants, and the more they share and contribute, the more elevated Greg and I can offer uh, stuff because really we're just a funnel of of whatever the energy brings to us rather than you know I know and this is the way it should be type of stuff and I I know Greg agrees with that a hundred percent you can only listen to me and Harry talk for so long yeah I can only <laughs> listen to Harry talk so long is really the the, the, the truth of that and you, very but, good, that's what, a big part of the reason why Harry said he wanted to do this was so that people could just watch a quick 15 or 20 minute segment instead of the full hour long episodes or whatever you want to call them. Uh, so a lot of people are saying it's just a little bit long to sit down and watch at one time. Uh, but apparently they don't have pause buttons on their computers or whatever, but, <laughs> but it's a good idea. I like it. It's, it's a great way to, uh, you know, to allow more people to listen, maybe on the way to work or something, a quick 15 or 20 minute thing. And we're also working on getting all of the recordings uh, up somewhere as podcasts. So you don't even have to have the video, you can just listen to audio. 
Uh, so that that's another part of the project that's coming up. So we're, we're pretty excited about this. And Harry's been doing a really good job. He, this was kind of his brainchild with the short videos. So he's, I'm excited to see what all comes out of this. I think it'd be a good thing. You have something, Tanya, to say? Sorry. Yeah, it, it took me a while into that to realize that what you're talking about is all the past podcasts and things. Are you talking about even the Monday night things that used to happen? The just a conversation ones? Those were not recorded. They're not recorded, okay. No, the, those were never recorded. Idea. What I find with them, I've tried to point people in the direction and they do find that because we don't get straight away down to any golden moments and that quite often we kind of know each other and chat, which is outside of golden moments as well, that they get lost, they get a bit bored with it, they get impatient. That's um, true. That's true. And, and th yeah, that's what I'd say specifically with the people who are, are pretty anxious on withdrawal of some kind not drinking or not doing drugs, they want to like, get to the point. So well, it's a great idea. One of the things that Greg and I have noticed is often by the group discussions or so on, the golden moment pops out. So it's true what they're saying, but they don't see the process because we, Greg and I don't, and the show doesn't have just golden moments to share. Uh, uh, so the, so what we're doing is, you're correct, we're taking the flow of the show and then when the golden moments pop out. And then also I'm trying to take, create segments, not just of the continual talk of the same person, but different pieces so that it's, it makes sense to people hearing a certain subject or a certain area from different perspectives. And that's the other thing that I've noticed on this show is we've, all of us have really not only enjoyed, but been enriched by the different approaches and perspectives to this very complicated topic. Simple answer, but complicated topic. And so this, this resource hopefully will help uh, in, in that direction. And there's another interesting aspect. Um, I've, I've been, of course, watching some of the other ones, and to be honest, this has been a shock. I had ideas or thoughts rolling through my head of what those shows were like. Now watching it with no thoughts, it's a totally different experience. So some of the shows, people who talked, I thought, eh, not so good. I'm watching it again and go, wow, fantastic. So we ourselves are having filters while we're watching or hearing the show. Our opinion is our biggest problem or Harry Drabitsky's biggest problem. And so th that, ha that, that gives us a second chance to listen. And, and the other thing is uh, we've cut out, just taking what we call gold modes. I could create easily another whole series from what was left out. There have been a lot of succulent and rich moments on our show. So anyway, that's enough promo on that. You know, excuse me, I got a little carried away. And the second, the second, my book, The Evolution of Addiction Recovery, it, it's, it's primarily written except for the introduction and the, and the last chapter. And it's going through a whole horrendous uh, editing process um, and uh, will be ready sometime, you know, around Christmas, I suppose, you know, type of thing. And, um, Again, that was written, and I'd have to say I didn't write the book. It seemed to write me, and uh, I hope, you know, it will also be a help, knowing that whatever I write right now in a year or two will be much better and so on. It's kind of a, a humbling process. Um, so with that in mind, let's get on to the show of the truth about addiction uh, recovery and uh, move into let's hopefully have a nice group discussion and ideas please please you know uh, nobody here knows absolutely everything about truth and the addiction recovery type of thing and so on yeah, uh, as, great. as you all know just go ahead and unmute yourself if you want to join in or hit the raise hand button i think if you hit pound six on the phone you'll unmute yourself pretty sure <clears throat> star six pound six something like that uh, let's, you know, let's go ahead and start. What I'd like to do is hear from 
everybody who's here about what you think addiction is. I think that would be a good place to start. Let's just see where everybody's at. So who wants to go first? Chris? I see fingers up with Chris. Go for it. Yeah, uh, thank you. Well, I've, um, my, um, my um, stepson, uh, he's just had his birthday, so uh, he decided the film we were going to see, uh, we saw a film uh, last night, and it was The Wolf of Wall Street. Has anyone seen that? I, I've seen it, yeah. Okay. It's about Wall Street and it's about addiction. It's very much about addiction and drugs and, you know, all these, uh, and it's a, uh, and, and it, I was, you know, it's a pretty shocking thing. Uh, but in a way, looking at this, uh, this guy destroy himself and his own life and thousands of other people's lives. Um, um, it's seeing it from the outside in a very <clears throat> grotesque way was very interesting because what I noticed is that um, there's no ability to wait for anything. There's no ability to take things take time. There's no, uh, no real connection between people. There's no real emotional bonding uh, and so on and so on. So of course, I couldn't help but think, well, and it's very impulsivity driven. Uh, this uh, salesman, this way, way of selling, and and um, very emotional. Yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> and um, so, so what I what I saw in that was um, this. It's it's all very much uh, seems to seems to be driven by the same stuff that you would see with ADD, ADHD. And we were talking about uh, well, Jeff died recently. And I know that he was also uh, having ADHD. So I was just suggesting that maybe this is a part of uh, addict, uh, addictive pattern somehow. somehow. Maybe a, a kind of wanting to self-medicate uh, using, uh, or, uh, you know, if, if you have too much thinking, too much speed in your, in your, I think there's Ned Holloway, a uh, famous American psychiatrist who also has ADHD. He says uh, it's like having a Ferrari with bicycle brakes. So you get really uh, <clears throat> high speed, very fast, but a terrible, uh, terrible long uh, time uh, breaking down. Uh, sorry, uh, taking the speed down. So getting very, very excited or very, very whatever, and then really having a difficulty uh, uh, slowing down again, almost feeling sick because it's so terrible to slow down. So I think that could be a part of, part of addiction. It's not, it's not um, we haven't really talked about this in this forum, but, but for me, for me that's, uh, that's the one. That's one. Uh, that's one that one. One of these indicators that that uh, it's a Ferrari with bicycle brake. <laughs> John, yeah, that that's definitely one of the reasons why people reach out for things to slow down what's going on up here, kind of escape that that the overwhelming reality that we create for ourselves. Yeah, it definitely makes a lot of sense. And also, Chris, you bring up a very valid point. If you live a life that has, let's let's say, values that emphasize greed and and lust and uh, things like, and and all of that speed that that it keeps attracting, is only it, it is true that the life we live does is a product of what we understand or what we want to project. And if money is the most important thing in our life, then, then that's going to take us out of balance. And uh, what, what that show emphasizes is success out of balance and, of course, failure that, that it leads to. And uh, so I, I, we, I think all of us see that the lifestyle that, that the world is, is endorsing is, is, can create a tremendous amount of stress inside ourselves. And that 
without a doubt creates addiction because as Greg has often alluded, we are always looking for a good feeling and the natural evolution in, in that lifestyle is cocaine, of course, and drinking would be two of the, the mandatory requirements for, for relief in, 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 in that or, or whatever. I, I've only used cocaine once and uh, it's speedy. Woo, it's really speedy. And uh, I didn't like it, but that's why I never used it again. But it was, it was definitely a dick. If you like speed, you know, that would be uh, the drug of choice, <laughs> you know, which I'm not advocating, by the way. So. <laughs> Hi, this is Joan. Hi, Joan. Joan. Hi. Um, so I appreciate the, the, you know, thought about overactive mind and how it causes a dis-ease in the body. And, and that is, um, you know, pulling away from being in the present. And I, I find that being in the now is, sort of the antidote for, you know, speedy mind. And that's what I think um, Sid was helping me understand. But I also, I, I, what you just said, Harry, um, what I guess Greg had said it, it's just the natural human tendency to want to feel good. And when the wanting to feel good, for me, goes into a habitual use. And I hate the word abuse, but misuse. Um, and over reliance on an outside chemical, mine being alcohol in the past. So I would think that just the human tendency to want to just feel good, just being content, just being, you know, okay in my own skin. Um, so I, can, I, I think it just is a human nature. There's no difference between you know, the word addict or a non-addict. I mean, it's just a human tendency, but it's over, uh, so it's an out, looking for an outside fix and losing control over whatever makes one feel good, whether in, you know, it's just behavior patterns. But it's always a thing in my, in my thought is that it's just, you know, losing control over wanting something that feels good and have the thought. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Joe. That's that's really the the main core issue of all of this is is habitual thought patterns, and I I truly believe that's what creates conditions like ADD and stuff like that. It's just we get so used to entertaining every thought that pops into our head that it becomes a habit. It becomes an addiction to that thinking, or we can have an addiction to a chemical, or you know an activity that we do it's it's we can become addicted to anything and we we normally don't call it an addiction until it crosses some imaginary line into what you know is generally considered too much but somebody who is you know using something on a non-regular basis is not considered an addict even though they're using it for the same purposes you know so we, we've created all these imaginary lines around you know what we even think of as an addiction and you know the fact of the matter is it all comes down to a thought pattern and a lot of trucks <laughs> yeah thank you john anybody else have something we had a couple of people just join in what we're doing we're we just kind of put the question out there what do you think addiction is like what is kind of your definition or your idea of it so if anybody has anything, please feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand in the, uh, the participant tab. I've, um, since considering this with the understanding through the three principles, I don't see it so much as that, well, obviously everybody wants to feel good. I see it more as an attempt to stop feeling what you're feeling in that moment and feel different from that. So where, where I've seen it when it's addiction to drugs and alcohol, it's to get out of a state of not feeling great. And quite often the alcohol or the drugs will take you to a different feeling state. Because it crossed my mind, Harry, when, um, no, sorry, Chris, when you were talking about ADHD and then Harry talking about cocaine and it speeds it up. Well, if you were having quite a lot of negative thinking, that was causing you to feel quite low and you speeded that up, wouldn't there just be more of it? 
there's something about it that takes you out of where you are, which is out of the now into a different type of now, which is why it can be so effective. That somebody I know quite well, his drug of choice is dissociative anesthetics. It takes him out of all thinking. It's the only thing that works or being absolutely floored with alcohol. A little bit doesn't do it for him. And it's so obvious there that the reason is to get him away from his feelings, which are coming from lots of thoughts which are not pleasant for him. That's, that's the number one uh, problem in the world everybody has in the world that when they break it down. I don't like my thoughts. And how do I, how can I control these negative thoughts in my mind? That's the question that I hear in, in all the milieus, whether it's native world or it's, it's an addiction world or, or South America world or, or Dan, Danish world or whatever world it is, everybody has that, seems to have that question. And it seems that if, when they see the answer to that question, they, they experience a breakthrough. Uh, but, but I do agree with what you're saying, uh, Tanya, Tanya. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, that, that, that question of, of how do we relieve ourselves when we don't feel right, that, that is the definition of an urge. You know, that, that's what an urge is, in my opinion. You know, that's, uh, it's, it's, it's not defined as an urge at that point, but it's an urge that, that seems to power us into chasing and one of the funny things is that once we're in it, I, I have never been able to just, you know, poof, it's, we're in it. And part of that is accepting that as well. But just easily, then it just easily, it gracefully moves on. Can you hear me, Greg? Uh, barely. Okay. Maybe to... How about now? There you go. That's better. Um, okay, so just quickly, um, when we're talking about choice, no choice in addiction, um, <clears throat> so there is the, and I'm always going to go back to the chemical piece of the brain <laughs> uh, when we're in it, um, that's different than a choice of well, I might pick up a drink today or I might not. When I'm in it, um, so I'll, I'll use, you know, I work at the safe injection site on Wednesdays and I see people, you know, they're allowed to come in, um, use heroin, shoot up whatever they shoot up. They're, that's a different, they're in a different state of, of oh, I'm gonna, you know, I, I can watch my thoughts and I know that my thinking creates, you know, the, the thought before I pick up. I mean, so there's different, Mm, stages, if you will, or there's different levels of that brain chemistry peak. Our brains are hijacked, basically. There's no choice when we're in it. You know what I mean? That chemical, those paths, it's all been changed. So there's a, a whenever I'm working with somebody who's still using a substance or, um, you know, my own experience, uh, you know, there's, I address that piece first but then doesn't mean that that can't change but then we talk about change once we address the withdrawal once we address the ab abstinence for a small period or whatever that looks like for the person but we can't ignore that our brains are hijacked in a chemical like process you know what i mean so then after that i think we can talk about start having conversations about we know what the real problem is you know what i mean i'm thinking um, but I always want to make sure we talk a little bit about the brain chemistry piece. So that's just my position. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a, a physical addiction to some of the chemicals that people are using. And that, that's, you know, that's its own piece. And yeah, they, they need to be medically detoxed and whatnot. You know, for sure there's that. We're, you know, what, what we talk when we talk about a choice is more of after they've been detoxed and that chemical is no longer in their system and they go back to it after they come out of rehab or whatnot. At that point, it's no longer a physical addiction. It's just a mental addiction. And that can look like there's no choice. It can absolutely 100% look like that. But at some point, 
we started making the choice to use that and it became subconscious. And as long as it remains subconscious, it looks like we have no control over it. You know, so that's, that's, that's why I like to talk to people also about just learning to be more mindful about things. And when I talk about mindfulness, I'm not talking about any particular like practice or anything. You know, it doesn't have to be like Zen Buddhism or anything like that, but whatever you can do to keep yourself more in the present moment to see what's really there, you're more likely to see that choice that happens. And it looked like that for me for the longest time with food. It's like I didn't have a choice, especially if I go to an all-you-can-eat restaurant. You can't just have one plate, right? I mean, that, <laughs> that goes against the whole purpose of going to an all-you-can-eat restaurant, doesn't it? But at some point, I saw that choice that actually happened where I, I just made the choice without even realizing it. And I'm not talking, like I said, I'm not talking about when there's that, that strong physical chemical addiction. Somebody on heroin, that's, you know, until you're detoxed from it, there's not much of a choice there. You know, there are some people who make the choice not to, and they go, you know, but they end up in detox and go through the whole treatment program. You know, so it's, yeah, that, that is, a, I'm glad you brought that up, Tanya. Because there are two different kind of areas of it that, that you can talk about with choice. And it, I, I've never used hair with myself because I don't really like needles. So I, <laughs> I don't know how that feels when they're on it. But from the, from what I've seen with other people, it does look like it's just, it's totally in control as long as it's in their system. Chris has something and also Scott. Yeah, just shortly, I just wanted to say, I, I did work with a woman, this is some years ago, we're helping people get, getting on in their life. And, She'd been on heroin for ten years, and she and she and she she, she didn't she wasn't on heroin anymore. And, and I asked her how what happened, and she said, "Well, one morning I woke up, and it just stopped." You know, um, yeah. So she changed her thinking, I guess. Yeah, and. Um, so that also seems to be the case, and I, I'm, that might be very rare. I don't know, but but it was like uh, like when people leave a, a, a violent marriage. Sometimes, sometimes they just say, "Enough." You know? or, they, or they say something uh, as a same story. A, a native uh, sh shaman uh, looked and was the biggest drinker in in his community, and looked in the mirror and says, "Ah, I look like I'm." I'm about 85 years old, and he stopped drinking. The fear of death was enough to, to stop him from, from drinking. You know, whatever it is that people have a realization, that's the moment of, of spiritual choice that we experience in, inside of ourselves. And choice is a, a big, big interesting word, Greg, because a lot of people are talking to me that the three principles is teaching that we have no choice. And I go, well, oh, that's not Sid's teaching. You know, it, it shakes me up when I hear that. I don't know what to say to them because they believe adamantly in what they're talking about and, and uh, you know, uh, explaining two different points of view is sometimes difficult in three principles. But there is a strong element that there is no choice. And I go, I don't understand that. But again, there is the, the experience that person went through, Chris, it's quite a powerful spiritual experience of insight, you know, that changed her forever. Uh, Scott, you had something to say? You have to unmute yourself. Well, I've been listening a lot to Bill Pettit, the psychiatrist, you know, and Fred for a while. And of course, you have to realize that everybody's body chemistry is different, you know, how, how we react to things and whatnot. And it seems to be unequivocally that when your mental health starts to go up and you start feeling better on your own, you can say, Let, if, we, if we could get into uh, the chemical part, the endorphins, your natural endorphins kick in, which is the body's uh, uh, own way of feeling good, taking care of pain and whatnot. It almost plays in competition with the other drug that you're taking that it, it gets to be to a point where 
the other drug just doesn't quite feel as good as what your natural feelings are starting to go. Because then I did know somebody that quit heroin cold turkey, which was amazing. I mean, I did go through some withdrawals and whatnot. And Dr. Pettit also talks about that sometimes, uh, you know, they have to, to, to lower the dosage. But what's happening with anybody getting mental health or picking up on that connection, and remember that your thoughts are always uh, uh, are, uh, are creating chemicals in the brain. So I can be happy, that creates a chemical in the brain. I can be sad, that creates a certain chemical. So you know, your body's always going through this sort of flux with your thinking. Uh, now, uh, to how much they, they prove that, I don't know, but uh, uh, I just remember that uh, also, too, that when I got a cold or a sore throat, man, I really felt terrible. I mean, just terrible. So I would go, I'd get an antihistamine, and it would dry up the sniffiness, and it gave me a chance to sleep and go on. But after I felt better, there's no way that I would pop a, an antihistamine to get high or enjoy myself. So I think everybody's chemistry is different on how it works. Uh, some people maybe have to, to go in gradations as far as uh, getting off, off of uh, the drug or whatnot. But the whole idea of raising one's state of mind or their, uh, their understanding uh, or the, just to their enjoyment uh, makes whatever they're doing you know, totally different. I only had the experience uh, uh, with quitting cigarettes and I tried so many times to quit and I'm a healthcare professional So I was playing that game on my head here. You are, you know Preaching health and you're smoking, but for me, I just had to get off my back and I you know, I had that I, I For the lack of a better word that seed was planted that one day I was going to stop the smoke I don't know how I was going to do it or what but I got tired of me talking to myself and getting on my nerves about it. And one day I put the cigarettes down and I left them there for two and a half years, just in case I wanted to go back to them. And the habit was gone. So I picked it up, I smoked the cigarette and the, and the habit, the habit was gone. And people said, well, Scott, you really didn't have the habit. Well, if I wanted a cigarette and I didn't have one, I'd go through the, the cigarette butts. I hate to admit that and, and take that off this, uh, thing i don't want to i'd look for a butt to light up you know so this I is a golden know. moment for the for the series what's that, what's that? <laughs> so here's another golden moment for the series oh, no, 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 let's no. no. talk about picking through cigarette butts i knew i went too far <laughs> no it's it's good <laughs> now what you said was beautiful scott honestly uh, I, I learned a lot from what you just said i i mean and i was it, it was beautiful Okay, so anyway, they're finding more and more, and they're, you know, now it's going to be more, you know, scientifically proven on, you know, on uh, to a degree. And again, I was just uh, listening to, to Dr. Pettit talk about that, people coming off of Thorazine and, and, and what, you know, and, and whatnot. I guess that's all I have to say with it. Well, if that you. makes sense. So what do you suggest, Tanya, when people are going through that other stage, like that, what I guess what you call Greg, the detox stage of of it. What do you, what do you recommend for people that would help them? Well, I went to withdrawal management. It's a medically <clears throat> uh, medical detox center. Um, for me, I had to go. That was my journey. I, I couldn't stop on my own, um, and I couldn't withdraw on my own because it's dangerous medically. Um, so for me, it was a detox center and then right to treatment from there so uh, that's my that's that's what i suggest to people especially people um well anybody it doesn't matter if it's alcohol doesn't matter if it's heroin doesn't matter if it's crack cocaine i mean anything our brain our bodies for me it's just it's better to be in a safe space with nurses and doctors and people to help if you need it so that sort of su supports what greg was talking about Great. You you seem to think it's about two weeks for the uh, whatever it is that you're experienced to sort of clean out where you can be up to a year. <laughs> it can be up to a year. It's called post acute withdrawal syndrome. Now we'll talk about with the actual chemical still being in your body. 
Right. There, well, okay, there's that. That's but then there's also the symptoms after. Like, I experienced a ton of stuff in my first year of, of after getting clean. Yeah. Again, whether it was my thinking creating it, I don't know. But I'm just saying my experience was I felt like shit for a year, <laughs> basically. Well, it, you know, let's, I think this might be a good Emotionally, place to mentally, say. physically, all three of those, spiritually, all of those. <laughs> while we're, you know, while you, while you brought that up, we're talking about that. It's not you know, with the three principles, it's not saying it's just your thinking. It, your thinking becomes real. What you entertain on a regular basis becomes absolutely real. So something that's psychosomatic is no less painful than something that's, you know, you hit your hand with a hammer. You know, it's still a painful experience, even if it is created by thought. Yeah. We make that stuff real. So I, I don't want anybody to think that we're, we're uh, belittling people who are having psychosomatic symptoms. That's, it's very real to you. You know what I mean? It, it's, it, you're experiencing it. It's happening to you. It's, it just, it's just self-created, which is a beautiful thing because it means you can create something else. That's all I ever try to say with that. It's not to say that, oh, it's just psychosomatic. No, it, it still hurts. <laughs> it still feels really bad. It does feel really bad. Mm -hmm. so we had, but then, uh, it gets Arvin, then it gets better. <laughs> yeah, then it gets much, much better. But Arvin had his hand up a little bit ago. So I'd like to see, do you still have something, Arvin? Uh, Chris also, Chris uh, Z Zarza also has, uh, has his uh, hand up as well. Is Arvin Go still around? Hi. Hi, Arvin. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. What's going on? Great. Uh, no, I just had a question uh, regarding one of the comments before. Um, when, um, I don't remember who's the person, uh, he said that uh, we do have the choice, um, right? So we have the choice of doing whatever we want. That's what apparently uh, Sydney Bank um, mentioned. So my question is, isn't our choice is also a thought in the moment? Oh yeah, of course. It's everything we experience is thought. So what what would that make us? It's just we don't have control over what we think about, no? So why would Sydney Sydney say that or we have control over what we're thinking? Because it's an inside out experience, Arvin. Mm -hmm. And you have to include yourself in that consciousness. If if consciousness is something outside of you then what would be the good of it? It's, it's who you are, it's your true nature. And you have to realize that you're part of the journey. Everything that you touch, you affect, include, uh, obviously including yourself and your own mental health. So it is true what you're saying, but Sid talks in various levels. And the, so on one level, when he's dealing with something psychological, we have free will to think whatever we want. On a spiritual level, we're listening to what spirit is and we're agreeing with it. Oh. Now that so being it's said, what, one of the things that, that I heard Sid talk about that may make it sound like we have no choice is that we, we really don't have a choice which thoughts pop into our heads. Mm -hmm. There's that constant flow of thoughts that come through and who knows what percentage of them we never even recognize as being there. Mm -hmm. But when we see a juicy one, one that's familiar, one that, you know, fits into our story of ourselves, we tend to grasp onto that. That's the choice. You know, it's, it's like that river of thoughts flowing by. There's going to be all kinds of things floating down that river. And you can choose to pull certain ones of them out and examine them and, and give life to them. But you can't really control what flows down the river. Does that make sense? And, so, and, so you may have a thought pop into your head about something, but it doesn't mean you have to entertain it. Okay. That, that last sentence is, that Sid would teach. You don't have, he said this continue. You don't have to act on all your thoughts. Mm. That's obviously free will. That's what Greg just said. You don't have to entertain. It's mm. this. It's the same understanding. And, and that is a revelation because when we're in the moment, it looks like 
we have to act on our thoughts. Yet something back here is saying, you fool, <laughs> you know, or something <laughs> like that, you know. Uh, but so, so free will is there, but you have to include yourself in it, Arwen. You can't, you can't it's not an outside in journey. Spirit doesn't mean outside and it's, it's just affecting you. Woo, it's a beautiful world. I haven't found that to be very effective, although I have been in that, you know. So, so include yourself in it, and the moment you do, you know, that's why people started to teach, you are the thinker, you know. Mm. Yeah, you just, are Just because a thought's in my head doesn't make it mine. No. Very beautiful, <laughs> that, that, That's Yeah, why take ownership over all of that? Now you're, you know. And you'll you'll have thoughts pop in your head. You're you're driving, and somebody you know in front of you hits their brakes really hard for no reason, and you get mm -hmm. you can have that thought pop into your head. How dare they? Don't they know I'm in a hurry? Don't they know I could have wrecked into them? But mm -hmm. it's not necessarily yours. It's just something that popped up in the moment. It doesn't yeah. mean it has to be handled or taken care of or given any attention. It's just there. And, and the other thing to understand, Arwen, in my opinion, just my opinion, is it, it's all perfectly designed. So if it's coming through you, that's perfect. And if you let it go, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all perfect. So on that level, there is no mistakes by God or by spirit or by mind, which depends what word you want to use. It's mm -hmm. just, it's all perfectly designed. If you get sick, that's perfect. If you get anything, it's all just perfect. If you get addicted, that's perfect. Greg's, Greg was addicted, Tanya, they, they're addicted, but yet it, look what it brought them. You know, like, you know it, it, brought clar it brought some clarity to, to Greg. You know, that, that's good news. He was, he was more stuck, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, and of course, we could, everybody in this room would say, me too you know by that so uh, i'm glad by the you way arvin you're you're really good at holding the same pose <laughs> really good you haven't moved at all that's pretty amazing that, that food of feeling the wound. <laughs> that's my picture so, i'm sitting on my bed so i don't i, I didn't open up <laughs> does, any, does anybody else have anything oh, to say on that oh there he is Chris has something, Zara. Chris Zara. Zarza. Sorry, Chris. What's your name? I, I had a couple comments on, on what you were just talking about. One of them, um, I had an earlier thought, but just what you were just talking about. If I acted on my thinking, I would be serving quadruple consecutive life sentences right now. I, <laughs> I imagine, I mean, Luckily, they're just fleeting thoughts. With uh, I remember I did. I've heard uh, 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 the psychiatrist guy that somebody just mentioned. I heard him say that a few times. And I thought, me too. He goes, if I if I acted on my thinking, I'd be in jail right now. But I wanted to make a comment, a tech, sort of a technical comment about um, addiction and my own personal experience with uh, cocaine addiction, and that um, for the first year or so you do have a pretty major chemical shift in your brain. Um, think, you know, it's similar to like a clinical depression because um, I'm not, I'm gonna probably misspeak on the, cause I'm not a doctor, but on the endorphins and the, and the receptors in your brain, it just takes so much, um, after being high in um, certain chemicals, and I'm sure it's similar with the heroin, that it just takes, um, it's really hard to feel good because it takes so much more of a chemical change in your brain. Your receptors are so overloaded with all these endorphins from the drugs, the way it shifts, the way your body works, that, it, that you, it's depressing. And it, it's absolutely, and I guess it doesn't matter if it's psychosomatic or not, but it's actually very much physical chemical change. And, it, and it, I think it's important to mention it just because it, it, it passes. It does pass. And you are could possibly be going through a physical problem, and you know the way to get through it is, of course, is not by taking more drugs. At least that's what took me a while. Um, 
And uh, it's shorter, I, uh, similar with cigarettes too, but um, I think it's interesting that um, somebody, I was just telling a story about their spouse getting out of the hospital with these cancer treatments and um, she was looking for her husband and he was behind, he was like in an alley nearby smoking a cigarette after he had been in the hospital for a couple months and had passed all his physical addiction of cigarettes and lit up a cigarette because of, I don't know, why do we do this? And do you folks think there's something, is, is um, excuse me, is, um, is there such thing as a, an addictive personality? Anyway, that's enough out of me. Well, we, we can develop one. We could, you know, if we can, we can develop a, you know, just more habit to feeling better is really what it comes down to. It's not something that we inherit. I don't believe anyway. I don't think it's something that we inherit from our, our genes, from our parents or anything like that. You know, we can point out, well, yeah, but my parents were also like that too. Well, yeah, where do you think you learned the habit from? You grew up watching your parents escape by having a drink every night after work or smoking cigarettes or whatever the deal was. And you, you pick up on that. And it becomes part of your belief system, part of that story of me. This is who I am. You know, that's, that's actually a, a pretty dangerous story to have, I find. Because <laughs> it keeps you closed off to having new experiences. We're, we're always comparing it to our previous ones. Well, I can't, like, like growing up, I really despised when my mom would make split pea and ham soup because I could not stand peas. I don't know what it was about peas. I couldn't, <clears throat> couldn't stand the taste or texture or anything about them. Now I like them. But I wouldn't have known that if I would have stuck to that story that I don't like peas. I never would have tried them again. You see, it's the, it's the same type of thing. I know that's not a dangerous situation. I'm not going to die of eating peas. I'm not allergic to them, so, I'm, you know. But it's, it's that same mental process behind it. We come up with that story. I'm an addict. You know, I'm always going to have this problem with cigarettes. And I fell into the same thing when, when I stopped smoking. You know, it was like every once in a while after that, I'd find myself just randomly going and buying a pack of cigarettes without really even consciously thinking about it, but it was that habit that I built up over those years. And sometimes those habits can pop back up occasionally. That's why we, we did a, a show about um, relapse a little while back. And that's why we did that show is to talk to people about that. It can pop back up as, as a, a thought. You know, it's a habitual thought pattern. It can come back up. And sometimes we'll indulge it, and sometimes we'll give in. It doesn't mean you're back to it. It just means it's a habit that you slip back into for a second. So that you know, the, the guy having the cigarette out in the alley doesn't mean he's back to smoking necessarily. Now, if he continues, he's probably going to be back to smoking. Does that make sense? Who was coming in? Um, just a quick thought. I'll shut up after this. Um, so please don't. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. Now I'm not about labels and saying I'm an addict and saying that okay, you know, keep being in a box anymore. It's not. I've I've let go of that um, because that doesn't help and it's not productive and it doesn't make sense to me anymore. We're all human beings and we just get lost sometimes. But take me little Tanya, 14 year old, 15 year old Tanya, and take one of my friends who, you know, I do a drug, they do a drug, I get addicted, they don't get addicted. Okay, I do believe, and yes, social determinants, of course, play a role. I'm alcoholic father, alcoholic stepfather, I grew up in that kind of environment. They might have as well, right? But they didn't get addicted. I do believe there is a small percentage of our population whose brain metabolizes differently a drug or an alcohol or drug or drugs and alcohol. Um, it's just because that's all, other, otherwise I can't make sense of why I 
my brain became, you know, my totally like for dependent on chemicals and theirs didn't. And we grew up in the same environments. Do you know what I mean? So I do believe when he said about um, addictive personalities, I mean, maybe, maybe not. I do believe though that our, all our brains are not exactly the same, uh, the way we process things and the way we metabolize things. Do you know what I mean? So, oh, yeah. yeah. Obviously, Tanya, Tanya, everybody has different weaknesses uh, within, with it. that's what makes us so interesting. We have different strengths and different weaknesses that we're- Addiction is not about strength and weakness though. No way. It's not about strength and weakness. Are you telling about genetics? I don't know. I, that's beyond my, I'm just saying in terms of um, what I've learned and, and what, what my, along the years I've, I've learned and what my experience is. So I don't know if I, I, I could have had a predisposition. I don't know. I don't know genetically if I'm, I just know that if we're going to talk about people's brains and sort of why somebody gets addicted and why somebody does it, you can't just leave it to just because I grew up in a certain environment. There's more to that. Oh, yeah. and also you cannot tell that your body is predisposed to addiction. Pardon? You cannot say your body is predisposed to addiction. No, I didn't say that. No. Okay, so what what exactly is the point? I'm trying to understand what you are trying to point to. Is that you are telling your body or your environment have any influence on your addiction? They probably both do. I'm not, okay, so I don't know, but I'm just saying he asked about. <laughs> he said, "Is there such thing as addictive personality?" And I'm yeah. and I'm just sort of branching off into that in terms of. I can't answer that, but I can say that there is a difference between a brain that gets addicted, like, and a brain that doesn't. There, 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 that is a thing. So, if you are saying that's the case, then it have to be a physical thing, no? Sure. Yeah, but I, I, was, I didn't know what you meant by physical. So, you're talking about the brain, yes. Yes. So, if it is that's the case, it's not. I don't think addiction is a physical thing, though. Okay. So, I, I'm I'm not an expert on addiction, so I you know. Yeah. Take my word with a lot of salt. Yeah, no, that's okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure this out because addiction is kind of a, your uh, way of thinking in the moment, no? If you could, like some people just uh, kind of like instantly stop their addiction. And there are a lot of cases where, you know, in, even in here, they just stopped. Yeah, well, if that was the case, I wouldn't have woke. I wouldn't have been homeless and lost my child for a year and a half. I would. That would be well beyond. I, I would have just been like in the moment. I don't want to do this, and you know what I mean. It becomes way more than just a thought in the moment. Well, it can. I think. Yeah, that's I think that's so. the thing. Is it's here, here's here's the thing. There is a physical component to this. Definitely. Let's not, let's not leave that out. There is a physical component to certain things, okay? Mm -hmm. Heroin is definitely physically addictive. And alcohol. There's, there, and, and alcohol can become physically addictive. That's the thing. Heroin is almost instantly physically addictive. Alcohol, mm -hmm. you have to drink a lot for, for a longer period of time for most people. There are some who maybe, maybe initially, their first drink, they're, they're off to the races. But that has that has nothing to do with an addictive personality. That has to do with how that chemical, right. right, right. What, what kind of physical experience that chemical creates for that person. If mm -hmm. you know, like you said, with your friend, if you both did the same drug, you came from, first of all, you can't come from the exact same environment. Oh, you know you, what I mean. Like, you could grow up in the same, in the same house and have a different experience than your siblings. But that being said, you have similar circumstances and all that. You both do the same drug that person physically doesn't create the feeling that they are looking for, but for you, it does. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, okay. <laughs> it gives you the escape and it creates that experience that you want from it. So you keep mm -hmm. doing it. They didn't. But it also gives it. people not addicted to that feeling and experience too, but they don't go and lose their house and their child. You know what I mean? There's a, <laughs> right. It's, it's a spectrum. Yes, that's, yes. Thing that, and that's, that's why I wanted to have this topic brought up on here yes. because it is not black and white cut and dry. Yes. And a lot of what I've been hearing, especially in the 3P community, is, is it's very black and white cut and dry type of thing. It's like, no, the, the experience is different for everybody. And part of that is physical, but I, I believe a bigger part of it is your mental experience of that. Sure. 
Yeah, if absolutely. that if that drug or that food or that whatever chemical you're putting in your body creates that escape that you're looking for, mm-hmm. you're going to do it again. For sure, for sure. Plain and simple. Yeah. If you don't know a better way, you're going to do that again. And anybody who knows a better way isn't reaching out for heroin in the first place. So yeah. or stuff like that. So obviously it's you know sure. if, if it creates that escape, people are going to keep doing it. I think also, sorry, just quickly, it's a bigger spirituality yeah. thing. As that, I mean, for sure, I was there was a hole in my soul, if you will, and I was trying to fill it. For sure, that's the big piece of it. But again, there could be a person with a hole in their soul take a drug and not go the route that I did. Do you know what I mean? So we got to really watch that sort of, yeah. Well, so what does that tell you about the physical addiction side of it, though? I don't know. I lost the lottery there. That's what happened there. <laughs> I don't know. But that's that's the thing. We don't really know exactly how or much it is physical, there. because there there are people who do heroin and never do it again. Exactly. Or they, or they do, do it, it socially. Or they do yeah. it for a while and then they get tired of it and stop. Or they do it a few times a year for their whole life. Yeah. Not you me. know. So it's. That's what I was trying to, I'm trying to be careful at how I'm saying it because it does tend to get people riled up and, and angry. And that's not what I'm trying to do here. And I'm good at doing that apparently just by talking about this stuff. But it's not as, as it's not as physical as it looks, I guess would be the, the way I'm trying to. Sure. Play. Sure. There. That's right. There's an appearance to it that there's a veil, I guess you could say. Did you have something, Joan? It looked like you were trying to talk there for a second. I think you, you you came to what I was thinking as well. Everyone, and when we say personality characteristics, again, I kind of, well, I agree with both of you because we only have our own experience. And everything that happens in our lives gives us wisdom. We may not hear it now, but we'll hear it when we are we are seeking the teacher to hear it or the moment to hear it because I will relive, you know, um, lessons to be learned unless I just stop using to run away from it. And I feel more grateful today for lessons I'm learning and have learned. But I kind of have to go back to what is a personality characteristic? I mean, that is ego construct. And who is doing ego construct except myself? I am the only one who is doing an ego construct. So I want to grow out of that to see what the divine energy that has put me on this planet to, to enjoy this experience and to be challenged by things that are not in my control and to accept things that are not in my control so I can have more deepening of the spiritual part of it um, to say, you know what, all I have is now. And, you know, this May I be aware, and also I'm so deeply grateful for all the conversations that I'm hearing today. So with that, I'll, um, I'll let y'all go on, and I'll enjoy the listening. <laughs> Thank you, John. We have two Chris's, uh, who I think, who wanted to talk as well. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I just wanted to... to I've been together with Dr. Bill Pettit several times, and I've also had some discussions with him. And one of the things that he, he says, pe- people are differently wired. For example, a person with autism has a different wiring than a, a neurotypical person. Or a person with, with ADHD uh, has a little bit different wiring than a, than a person who doesn't have it. And uh, there's a discussion going on about uh, this. This might be an evolutionary thing, actually, because in, in, in from the old times uh, we we had to survive. In, uh, the way of this uh, tribe was surviving was because of uh, that we were hunters. That we were we were able to go out and catch some prey. And uh, when there was no uh, nothing to hunt, or when we when when people had. had um, got there, the, the, the food, fine, you know, relax, lie, lie by the river, <laughs> do nothing until, oh, we better get, catch some more. So that would be kind of a hunter type. And then later on in the evolution, we got um, the farmers. It's kind of like uh, 
crops and and putting the seed in the uh, in the uh, you know staying in the same place, waiting for the um, stuff to grow up. Uh, you know, um, like building schools and churches and you know having um, uh, society as we know it. <laughs> um, uh, so so so. So that would be, the hunters would be like, uh, it's a good thing to wait. Uh, you'll get your reward in the long run uh, and so on. Well, the, hunt, well, the hunter is more like a, uh, you get your reward when you, when you go out hunting. So if you say that the society has changed more and more to be a kind of a farming society type, um, patience is good. And so, so so, so in this way of looking at it, um, if you had this, uh, let's say, impulsivity, you 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 uh, you're very much in the moment because uh, wow, something is happening. You wake up. Uh, that might also indicate that that you uh, you might be uh, um, let's say wanting to take more risks than others. So, no, let me try that, you know, let me not do that, you know, do anything. <laughs> and for me, that's, uh, that, that would be a way of seeing that, that there's, that even though we are human beings, we're not working the same way. So that would be a way of saying, well, for some people, uh, some people do get more or easier addicted than others because because their behavior is more uh, risk-taking, uh, because that's what feels real. Okay, long rant, but I think that's important. And, and it is an individual experience. We all have our separate realities, and we, we all experience things differently. That is a, a key point, you know, that those, like I said earlier, that's part of the reason why uh, we wanted to have this topic come up was to point out to people that there is no definite one way, but there is one answer. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's the beauty of it. You, you can come to addiction in a thousand different ways. Some people build up to it. Some people, it's a, you know their first time trying something. But the answer to moving past it and finding that ease and comfort in life is quite simple and it's the same for everybody. And it's almost too simple. <laughs> you know, people, people want something to be more complicated. There has to be some, some program I have to go through or something. But the fact of the matter is we're already well. Regardless of what it looks like in our circumstances, we're already well, and we can access that well-being at any point in time because it's always there. Maybe I could. I'd like to tell a quick story to wrap up this session. Just you tell see. a quick story. Yeah, I'd yeah. like to see that. <laughs> okay, I'll, as quick as I can. I'll just kind of supports what Tanya alluded to in a way. My mother at at age 45 had a nervous breakdown and she took these heavy pharmaceutical drugs till 65. She had a spiritual insight and, and said no more, which everybody revolted against except myself. And it took Tanya four years for those drugs to, to clean out from her. And she was changed forever. But the fact of the matter is each year she grew happier and con more content and she lived to 95. She would have been dead if she would have been on the drugs probably by the 75. So the, the fact was she was never the same as she was before. She was a totally different person, but she had evolved to happiness and contentment and she'd never liked any negativity or stress. And so she, had, she lived a golden life. And the best news of all, she created no hardships for her kids, which included me. And that was also deeply appreciated. So I just thought we, that would be a good ending story to, you know, to what I have seen it from my mother and what she taught me. And to be honest, that happiness and contentment that she experienced in her 
last 15 years of life was golden. And what more could anyone want from a mother who was addicted to these pharmaceutical drugs? That's great. Well, thank you everybody for participating today. This has been a great discussion. Uh, really appreciate it. So I look forward. It. Yeah, it was really, we'd do it again. We'll do it again, Greg. It's, it's, it's obvious that what was uncovered here today was, is helpful. Yeah, thanks everybody. Appreciate it. Uh, have a great day. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you guys next time. Good night, guys. Oh, there we go.